Um, we'll make a short introduction. Uh, dear colleagues, dear friends, so welcome to our today's uh, online seminar. It is my pleasure to introduce Tim Hoheisen as our speaker today from McGill University. So Tim received uh, his PhD in mathematics from the University of Würzburg, 2009, and uh, he was uh, on a postdoc position at the same university until 2016. In between, he was for one semester a uh, visiting professor at the University of Dusseldorf. Since 2016, Tim is uh, as a professor at the McGill University in Montreal, so he, he moved to Canada, and Tim became yeah, this summer associate professor at the same university, and since uh, last this month, okay, he's the director of the Applied Math Lab um, uh, in, in Montreal. So Tim is uh, yeah, working on a, a wide spectrum of topics in optimization, analysis. He's uh, yeah, uh, very much uh, working on, uh, let's say, uh, topics uh, with a theoretical character, but uh, yeah, he uh, had Oh, he had also some recent contributions on development of numerical algorithms. So, a wide research profile, very good publications. Tim, it's our pleasure Tim, to welcome you to our seminar. Yeah, uh, thanks, Radu, for the uh, kind introduction. And uh, even more thankful uh, to the organizers for the uh, invitation and for, well, inventing this, this whole uh, seminar series that was really, uh, I remember, about 18 months ago, uh, when the when the lockdown started, this was really a, a godsend in a sense uh, to to start to start off my week every every week from uh, from home. Uh, that that was really great to have this this great seminar uh, series, and it's still still going strong. So thanks a lot uh, to uh, Radu, uh, Shoham, and Matthias for uh, initiating this. Okay, so. Today I'm going to talk about uh, a project that I uh, have been working on with uh, Michael Friedlander from uh, University of British Columbia and uh, one of my uh, undergrad students, Ariel Goodwin at McGill. And uh, so the the first slide is really well, it's it's of motivational character, but also just to uh, get on the same page as for. Um, notation and terminology really so I, I guess in this in this kind of uh, uh, setting I don't need to uh, talk too much about what what the proximal operator is in and how it is important in, in theory but mostly also in, in algorithmic settings um, so gamma naught will be uh, in what follows just the, the set of all closed proper uh, convex functions and I'm using the, the notation of, of uh, Rockefeller Wett's book for uh, for the proximal operator. And so lambda, I will re refer to here as the prox parameter and uh, X I will refer to as the base point just to have some, some, some monikers for these because this is gonna be important later on. Okay, so as we know, the prox map is just the, the solution mapping of this quadratic, uh, uh, quadratically perturbed optimization problem here, okay? And uh, so it, there, there's a well-known result which you could find in, 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 in Bauschke and Combat's book or uh, in Armia Beck's book also, that if you want to uh, compute the projection of some point, uh, X bar, alpha bar, onto the uh, epigraph of uh, the function F, Right. If f is convex, then, then that that's a convex set. If f is closed, then it's a closed convex set. That so everything is nice. Then you can do that by solving a uh, an equation um, where which is an equation in essentially the uh, prox parameter lambda, and then you solve that scalar equation, and you can plug it back into this expression here uh, of the proximal operator. And then, then you obtain the, uh, the projection onto the epigraph. And we, we sort of took this uh, as, a, as, a, as a send off to, to look a little more into really the 
convex analytic properties of the proximal operator, not just as a function of the of the base point, which is extremely well studied and basically everything is available that you possibly want, but also as a function of uh, the prox parameter. And then as, at the end of the day, uh, as a function of, of the prox parameter and the base point uh, simultaneously. Okay, so um, so what we what we do is we first embed this whole uh, business in a, in a slightly larger, uh, perspective. Um, this 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 broader perspective is really more interesting if you're looking for uh, the variational properties of the Moreau envelope, which which is just the solution function where uh, the proximal operator is is the solution. Uh, excuse me, the Moreau op, uh, operator is uh, Moreau envelope is the uh, optimal value function where where the prox is the uh, optimal solution function, but I think it's still worthwhile to, to look at this uh, slightly uh, broader perspective here. So um, the, the, we, we can write and extend this, this whole um, problem to, to lambda equals zero using the notion of, of a perspective map, okay? And uh, well, this is, this is a really old, old tool it's i mean you can find it in rockefeller's book he's not going to call it perspective map though but it's it's already there and it has very nice properties and that just affords us the possibility to uh extend this uh parametric optimization problem here uh to 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 the essentially limit case lambda equals zero right um, and uh, perspective maps, as I said, occur as early as Rockefeller, possibly earlier. Uh, I didn't do the whole archaeology here, but uh, have been uh, used uh, quite recently in uh, papers by Arafkin and uh, co-authors and uh, Patrick Combat and Müller in uh, yeah, 18 and 19. And uh, so, as I said, what we want to study now is really the solution map, which um, I'm going to call P uh, sub omega F. Of course, if omega is just the Euclidean norm square, then P omega F is the, the prox operator. In the, in the paper uh, on which this talk is based, we, we also, of course, uh, do the whole variational analysis of the, um, of the uh, of the value function, which then boils down to the Moreau envelope in the uh, Euclidean case, but this is really this is somewhat easier than than the solution map, really, which is, a, I guess, a general principle. Okay, so um, for this uh, purpose, let's take a step back and introduce some uh, notions from from variational analysis. So I, I, I guess some of you are very familiar with it. Some of you might not be that familiar with it. I guess everybody knows the tangent cone. So the the, the set that is underlying here is is just uh, really the the I would say the complementarity manifold, right? Um, and which which is a cone. So at the at the point at the base point here, uh, x bar equals zero zero. Say, um, it it equals the tangent cone, right? Um, and then the regular normal cone is just the the polar of the uh, of the tangent cone. Some some people also call that Frechet normal cone, right? So it's uh, the light purple set here. And then the limiting normal cone comes from, uh, well, taking outer limits of uh, Frechet normals, okay? And of course, I, I took an example where, uh, where we're not Clark regular so that the, that the regular and the limiting normal cone don't coincide at the uh, point in question, of course. Um, for, for every other point of that uh, complementarity manifold, of course, you're locally convex and then the, the regular and the limiting normal cone will coincide. But uh, of course I chose the point where that isn't true. Okay. Um, and using these uh, notions for sets, one can define uh, notions of, uh, well, derivatives for set valued mappings. Um, and 
that's uh, the, the, the two most prominent ones are the co-derivative and the graphical derivative. Well, the co-derivative is based on, well, well if, you will, if you will, dual objects and then the graphical derivative is based on, on primal objects. Um, the co-derivative has a very, very rich uh, calculus and uh, the, the graphic derivative is slightly easier to compute straight like straight up by 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 the definition and the calculus is not as rich but there are some re uh, recent papers by Banco, uh, Matush Banco and uh, Patrick Melitz which address this actually quite nicely. Okay, so enough of an interlude. There will be probably another interlude where I'm using uh, where I'm going to introduce more concepts from. Uh, set valued and variational analysis, but uh, this, this is good for now. So let's, let's go back to our uh, initial uh, project of establishing the variational properties of uh, this uh, optimal solution function. And like for convenience, he's just a, uh, as a reminder, uh, the, the optimization problem that defines P omega F and uh, well, let's assume that omega is strictly convex and level bounded. Well, which of course then gives us uniqueness and existence of, uh, of uh, P, uh, at least for lambda positive. And let's also assume it's C2, okay? Then, well, as I said, the, the solution operator is, is single valued. Um, it's not a set valued map really. Uh, if lambda is positive. And if I have a positive definiteness of the hashing of uh, omega uh, at a certain point in question, then uh, I get local Lipschitz uh, uh, continuity of that solution operator. And if I throw some more ingredients, uh, some more conditions in there, uh, namely the, the proto-differentiability of the subdifferential sub operator, um, then I get, uh, in addition, directional differentiability of the solution map. And uh, I can actually write down a, a formula for, for that directional derivative, uh, which of course it, it's a matter of taste if this is a nice formula or not, but at least there, there is one. And it, it boils down to, uh, to certain, it, it, it simplifies significantly, of course, if uh, uh, omega is a Euclidean norm squared or weighted Euclidean norm squared. So now let's, let's talk about these, these assumptions maybe for a bit. Um, well, level bounded and strictly uh, convex, of course, if omega is strongly convex, which would be true for any weighted uh, Euclidean norm, um, then, then that, that's satisfied. And uh, so the proto-differentiability of F is, well, a referee, uh, a very knowledgeable referee of the paper pointed out that this is uh, equivalent to twice epi-differentiability of F in this case. I don't know if you prefer, <laughs> prefer that to proto-differentiability or not, but it's certainly uh, something that has been discussed uh, quite, uh, Quite intensively in uh, recent papers uh, by by uh, Boris Mirukovic and, and and his group for sure. Uh, but for me, it's for for for, for us now. It's it's really not important what the exact def uh, definition of proto differentiability or twice epi differentiability is right now. But how can we see like in a in a given problem that it's satisfied? Well, if F has this this convex composite structure and G is piecewise linear quadratic and F is C2 such that the basic constraint qualification holds, then that, that will hold uh, the proto-differentiability of the sub-differential operator. And well, what is the basic constraint qualification? Well, it's some kind of Mangazarian, like it's, it's, a, it's a glorified Mangazarian from of its con condition uh, in terms of flavor. And if G is finite value, you don't have to worry about anything, then it's, satisfied at every uh, every point okay right so 
this is the the variational analysis of of this this oper of this solution operator. But of course, there it says part one, so there will be a part two where we uh, refine this. Um, okay, so here's a, a second uh, interlude on, on on variational analysis. So. Some or maybe most of you will be familiar with the notion of semi-smooth uh, functions, right? In the in the sense by I, I think Mifflin um, laid this out in the in the scalar case, and then there's a there's there's a famous paper by Shi uh, and Sun about the the semi-smooth uh, Newton uh, algorithm where where everything is uh, now vector valued. Most of you will be familiar with that, but um, recently, well, not that recent anymore, like four or five years ago, Freire and Yiji Altrata uh, came up with, with, with a notion or established a notion uh, of semi-smoothness star um, for sets, actually, and then based on that for um, set-valued maps. So, and it, this whole uh, machinery is based on uh, an object, which is the directional normal cone, um, which is based on, um, well, directional outer limits of, uh, of Frischet normals, right? So this is, this is just the, the formal definition and there's some, some uh, easy facts uh, about this, this, this operator of course, this this will be non uh, this will be empty valued if u bar is not in the tangent cone of a because otherwise I cannot even find the sequences u k to u bar and t k to down to zero such that x bar plus t k u k will even be in a that's that's straight up the definition of of the of of, of a tangent uh, vector right so that that's rather uh, simple to see and. I guess equally simple to see would be that uh, the the normal cone, the limiting normal cone, is a subset of uh, um, the the directional normal cone. I guess there is a u bar missing here. Um, yeah, there's a bar missing for for all u bars in uh, e. Okay, and then based on the, on this notion, uh, Freire and uh, co-authors define semi-smoothness star of, of a set. And then based on that, they define semi-smoothness star of a set valued map. Now there's actually quite a nice calculus that comes with semi-smoothness star. Uh, and here just two uh, simple observations that they that they provide in, in, in their papers. So if A is convex, then uh, A is semi-smooth star. And a finite union of semi-smooth star set stays semi-smooth star, which is very nice. Um, so think of, uh, I guess, polyhedral, uh, set value mappings whose, whose graph is the union of finitely many polyhedra, then, then you're in business, a business with semi-smooth uh, star, right? Okay, so can we, can we bring this notion to bear uh, for our uh, solution operator? Well, first, um, let's well, discuss one other question. Namely, what, what does semi-smooth the star have to do with semi-smoothness, right? Well, the answer is given by Freire and Utrata in their paper uh, from 19, uh, 20, 2019. Um, so if you have a, have a local ellipsis map, then the only difference between semi-smoothness and semi-smoothness star could potentially be directional differentiability. Okay, so in this in this set in this sense for lo locally Lipschitz function, uh, semi smoothness star is weaker, right? And, uh, however, in their papers they they lay out uh, a few uh, possibilities to still define uh, 
fast convergent uh, Newton type methods for based on semi smooth uh, star and not semi smoothness so without possible directional differ differentiability and um, so now let's let's bring this to bear on on our solution map from before can we establish semi smoothness star and the answer is yes um, namely under semi smoothness star of the sub differential operator, we get semi smoothness star of the um, solution map P. And then, of course, we already proved that proto differentiability of the sub differential operator gives us directional uh, differentiability of the solution operator. Well, and then putting this together with proposition four explains the second item here uh, of this result, right? Because semi smoothness star plus direction of differentiability gives us semi smoothness. So that's, that's nice. And uh, we all also discussed before uh, under, under which conditions um, we, we can get these, uh, well, properties for the sub differential operator. Um, so for piecewise linear quadratic or uh, C2F, then, then all of this will be satisfied. And if omega is a uh, Euclid weighted Euclidean norm, then uh, strong, strong convexity and C2 is of course also not a, not a, not a problem. Okay, um, now we, we're, we're going uh, back to the slightly more concrete setting where omega now will just be the Euclidean norm squared, and then everything is the proximal slash uh, Moreau envelope setting uh, that, that we all uh, are used to and that we all like and appreciate, hopefully. Um, so when I first started looking into this, I was not aware of this result. So we proved it, and then I found that it had already been proven by uh, as early as Atouche uh, in his uh, really, uh, seminal uh, monograph, I don't know, from the 1980s, 83 or 84. Um, but it, yeah, so the, the question was really, well, I know what happens when the, when the, with the, with the proximal operator, if I, if I take limits of the, of the base point, but I didn't really know what happens if I take limit of the prox operator as at least when it goes to zero. And what happens is that, uh, it, the operator goes to the, the projection uh, onto the closure of the domain, right? And uh, well, this, is, this was observed in Atouche. We have a slightly different proof, which is based on uh, epigraphical convergence. And there is actually a result, a deeper result on monotone operator theory in rockefeller Wetz, um, which also has this, uh, as, as a consequence. So then this is why I have all, all these uh, references here. Now, uh, this, this, this natural extension of the proximal operator that I'm uh, writing down here is just to basically embed this in this set valued analysis uh, setting. But the, I, th I think it, it, it is natural in the, in the, in the sense that uh, uh, proposition six clearly suggests what it should be at lambda equals zero. And then I'm just going to set it to be the uh, empty set for uh, lambda negative. Okay. And uh, well, these are the results that we uh, established. And, and so part partially, some of these results were in uh, uh, Miltzarek's thesis, which by the way, I, I strongly recommend people to read that there's really lots of really good stuff uh, in there. And uh, so he looks at, at variational properties of the Moreau envelope and the prox operator. And the, the prox parameter in his case can be a, uh, well, positive definite matrix. He doesn't necessarily uh, concern himself too much with the, with the limit case, which is also more difficult, of course, in the, in the matrix case, but um, he has some of these results uh, already. And then there's another thesis by Thomas Strömberg, which it almost seems like nobody has read, uh, but there's, there's really lots of good stuff in there. Uh, it's 
it's appeared in a um, by a Polish publisher. I mean, I, I have a reference later. It, it, there's this lots of interesting stuff on infimal convolution and proximal operators in Moreau envelopes. Um, okay, so what does this result say? Well, it says that this 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 extended proximal operator is certainly continuous and locally Lipschitz on the interior of its domain. You get calmness um, at points x bar zero when x bar is in the domain of the subdifferential, um, which of course could be slightly smaller than the domain, but um, could also be the whole space if f has full, full domain. Um, then, then P is calm at, 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 at a point X bar zero, which just means, well, it is a Lipschitz type condition, but, but oh, excuse me, uh, but I cannot wiggle. I, I have to fix basically at one place here in this difference, I have to fix X bar zero, right? And, and, and local Lipschitz continuity would, be, would allow me to wiggle in both places, okay? And, uh, so under the assumptions of, of B, which is just uh, being X bar being in, in the domain of the subdifferential, then uh, the map uh, PF just as a function of the prox parameter is locally Lipschitz also at zero. Okay, and uh, so now, now we put this all, all of this information together, uh, that we that we had also before on, on directional differentiability of the of p omega f and now omega is just the Euclidean norm squared and we get the under the proto differentiability assumption we get the di directional differentiability of the of the of the generalized or extended prox and the, the formula now looks a little more friendly uh, at least uh, to me and um, yeah so. I haven't I hadn't seen this formula before, uh, to be honest. I mean, I, I don't I'm not aware that it's anywhere else. There is a formula, I think, if uh, in a paper by um, Iria Uriti, maybe, and uh, for the for the directional differentiability of the prox, uh, but only as a function of the of the base point and not the prox parameter, which is really the more interesting case given our, our motivation uh, for us, at least of course, not in general. Uh, and again, I wanna point out this, this, uh, this subtle difference between, uh, well, semi-smooth star and semi-smooth was just directional differentiability and directional differentiability is not a given if, if um, so for example, the, the, there, there's a famous example in, in 2D by Shapiro um, that already the projection onto a closed convex scent uh, need not be um, directionally differentiable, okay? So that, that's actually an argument for semi-smoothness star even in the locally Lipschitz case, right? Over, over standard semi-smoothness. Okay, so uh, let's wrap these uh, variational properties up here for the, the proximal operator. We have conditions um, for semi-smoothness star. Again, if, if, if the uh, subdifferential operator is semi-smooth star, then the prox operator will be semi-smooth star uh, as a function of the base point and the prox parameter simultaneously. And uh, then the, the, as a function of the base point, you actually have an if and only if but what, what's behind this if and only if is really that I should have maybe said that earlier that a set value map is semi-smooth star if and only if its inverse is semi-smooth star. Um, and that's really behind this because you can of course write the prox operator as a resolvent. There you have your inverse and then you invert it again and then 
well, you, then you have your sub-differential if you bring the identity to the other side, right? So that, that's the only if uh, part. And then you get uh, your semi-smoothness star here um, uh, combined with proto-differentiability, then you have semi-smoothness. And uh, there are plenty of uh, conditions, uh, verifiable conditions, which, which yield all these more abstract and more, more subtle concepts. But there, there's, of, of course, work to be done there. Um, th this, is not, this is not an exhaustive list of, of checkable conditions. I mean, uh, that, that is definitely uh, future future uh, work to to be much more uh, precise here with, with these conditions. Okay, um, now let's go back to the to the map that we actually care about when when we think about solving this this the scalar equation. It was not I mean, of course, it wasn't because it's a scalar equation. It was not just isolated a, a function of the prox uh, 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 prox operator. It, it's actually the prox operator plugged back in, into the function, the, the, the function in question. And um, so that was actually the first question that uh, kicked off this, uh, this project. Michael Friedlander asked me, do you know anything about this function? Is it convex? And I said, I, I don't know. I, I've never thought about it. And turns out it's, of course, it's not convex in general. In many cases it is, but it, it doesn't have to be convex. It's always decreasing, uh, which of course Atush already knew in 84. And it is also, well, it is continuous even um, if I go to the, to the limit, which is, it, it's not clear right off the bat. So there, there's a couple of lines that one has to write down because of course F it, we, you could go to the boundary of the domain, right? So then, then that's not clear. Um, okay, and so, so this function is decreasing. So that's a scalar function. So that, that's basically monotonicity, right? So maybe it is the, the gradient. Well, it's a scalar function. It's the derivative of something convex. Well, yeah, it is, sure. But of what? Well. This can't be the, it's gotta be the, the gradient of something concave, but wait a minute. Yeah, anyway, <laughs> there, there's, a, there's a scalar convex function associated with uh, whose derivative is the negative of, of that uh, proximal value mapping. And th that function is essentially lambda times Moreau envelope of, of lambda F evaluated at the, at the base point. And then you, you, you can extend it, well, to zero and you can ex actually, well, you, you could just set it, I guess, plus infinity, but we, we wanted to extend it continuously uh, uh, to, the, to the case lambda is uh, negative. And then, well, as I said, well, its derivative is the negative prox uh, value and this function is continuously differentiable, blada, blada, blada. And its derivative is locally Lipschitz uh, for lambda positive. And um, one can refine these results more and more and more. Uh, but, the, but the important takeaway here is that the, the prox value or the negative prox value is the derivative of this function. Uh, negative lambda times Moreau as a function of lambda, okay? And um, so this, this, this all fits nicely together, it's a bit technical, but um, so what we want to do now is of course, study the uh, convex variational properties of this function um, and recall, that that's the function, okay, phi. It's it's based on some convex function psi. It used to be called f before, but for 
certain tactical reasons. I don't want to call it F right now because it's not going to be F later on. Something that has to do with F but isn't quite F. So that's why I'm call, going to call it Psi right now. And um, well, what it is, is um, it turns out that um, I, can, I can study this function via what, what is called, uh, well, post compositions. That, that's a, that's a uh, Le Maréchal and Iria Uriti uh, term. We, we all know if we plug in uh, a, a closed proper convex function into a scalar convex function under certain conditions, if the outer function G, the scalar, uh, the scalar one is increasing, then I still end up having a convex function. And uh, so I, 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 can, I can study this class of functions using, using this uh, map phi psi. And uh, I, can, I can write down the Moreau, I can compute the Moreau envelope where uh, phi bar occurs and I can compute, well, at least I have, I have some expressions for it. The, the prox operator of this composition. And it, it, it boils down again to this scalar equation. Now this, is, now this is our connection to the original problem, uh, right? Where we want to compute um, projections onto, uh, onto epigraphs and I just have to plug in the right psi, okay? And this is what I'm going to do now. So this is a this is a much more general result that that does not only that has nothing to do at this point with with epigraphical projections. But as a special case, I can get the epigraphical projection results um, and level set projection results if I plug in the right uh, if I pl plug in the right psi. That's why I said I, I don't want to call it f because now I'm going to plug in psi equals f minus alpha bar, then I get the projection, or, and g is, is the indicator of the non-positive reals. Then I get, as a consequence of this more general result and post compositions, I get level set projections. And if I take the same g and take, well, slightly different psi, where now, of course, not only x, but also alpha is moving, then I get the uh, the epigraphical projection result. This is we knew part of this result before, literally from the first slide. But now we uh, we have this well, somewhat partially dual optimization problem, scalar optimization associated to it, and uh, of course its optimality conditions will be well an extension of the scalar equation that occurs, occurred on the first slide. But the point is now, well, I wrote this now as an optimization problem. Here, it's a strongly convex one. Here, it's just a convex one. Um, but, and, and, and of course, the, the, the flavor of this optimization problem, well, it's scalar, just depends on the variational properties of this function phi bar of f. But we know it because we know its derivative, it's di differentiable for lambda positive and its derivative essentially is the, well, it's the negative prox value, which we've studied uh, in detail. And we can tap into what is called SC1 optimization. That is just optimization of functions whose gradient is semi-smooth. And we have all the conditions now at hand because it will only depend as, at the end of the day on the variational uh, properties of the prox oper operator as a function of the prox parameter, right? So, um, so there, there's, a, there's a paper, it's quite old uh, by Peng and Shi. Uh, where they where they lay out this SC one optimization framework, and and we can just plug into this straight up. I'm I'm straight up plugging into their algorithm our data, and this is the Newton method, the SC one Newton method. I'm getting, 
Um, but of course, uh, there, there's, there's some stuff to be said here. Um, this epsilon that occurs here is, is a regularization parameter because your, 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 uh, your uh, derivatives might not be invertible, but in the, in the epigraphical case, it's not needed and you should throw it away because you improve accuracy. And, but what you can maybe already see is that computationally that that's a bit, a bit of an overkill uh, and the computational bottleneck will be this Armeo uh, backtracking in, in step three. And now the question is, well, can I get around basically the, the damping? Well, and the answer is yes, you can basically always take a full step if, um, well, the prox value or the negative prox value is a concave function, right? Which is very often the case. Otherwise you might run into cycling, but we know that from, 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 from Newton's method, right? If here's, here's a nice picture where you would run into cycling because the, the, the concavity uh, assumption of, of, the, of the prox value is not satisfied. So, but this is now the full step uh, SC1 Newton method. And you can nicely, well, you just, you just run it and it, it, it works quite well. This is just a proof of concept. I'm, I'm not trying to sell an algorithmic uh, math. Like, uh, I'm not trying to sell a software package, but it, it, it performs on par with, for example, projecting onto the L1 unit ball, which in our lingo is just a level set projection, right? Uh, it performs on par with uh, methods which are specifically tailored to uh, projecting on the L1 unit ball. And that, I mean, that, that, that is of course encouraging. And uh, if, if it's kind of a, a, a restarted scenario where, where, where if you have a good starting point, then of course, I mean, you would hope that a Newton type method per performs better because you get, you start in the, in the regime where you already have a, a super linear or quadratic convergence, right? Right, so um, I'm basically done. I just wanted to uh, point out a few points that, that kind of became clear throughout at least the first point that we need to understand uh, the, the semi-smoothness star of the, of the um, sub-differential operator better. And uh, we need to establish checkable conditions which, uh, which are weaker than the ones that we already have. And, and then maybe extend this whole business to non-convex uh, F or extend it actually to, and to monotone operators. And uh, then the next thing is, well, the, this, this has nothing to do with really with epigraphic, well, it does a little bit. Um, see, we, we, we proved this result on uh, post composition and of the setting was G composed Psi, where Psi is a closed proper convex function and G, uh, G is a, uh, scalar convex function. But of course, you can generalize this uh, convex composite setting to where, where the inner function is, is not uh, scalar valued, but vector valued. And then you tap into, into the notion of K convexity. And can you basically execute the same same computations and then get projections onto K epigraphs and K level sets. So that, that's something that, that we're working on uh, right now. And yeah, so I'd like to basically finish with, uh, with a list of recent references with, with, which have uh, been mentioned uh, during the talk and which have certainly uh, had a big impact on on the, on the paper that that we put together and and uh, consequently on this talk. So the the first one is Atush's uh, uh, 
monograph from from eighty four, which which I've mentioned a few times, and that that I definitely wanted to to point out. And I forgot to put Strömberg's thesis in here, which is not good. I should uh, should have done that. So Strömberg's thesis, I forget the name. Thomas Strömberg is the name um, of, of of the author. Okay. Well, thanks a lot uh, uh, for for your attention. Thank you, Tim. Thank you very much for a very nice talk. Uh, are there questions? So then probably I should ask a first question. Uh, okay, so we have a question. Yeah. Yes. Uh, hey, hey, Tim. Thanks for the nice talk. Uh, just a very quick question. Uh, so in, in most of the slides I saw, uh, you you're presenting on Euclidean space. I just wonder, uh, is it, it, the result generalizable to an um, uh, to an infinite dimensional space? Um. Um. Well, the, the I'm not aware right now for any results on semi-smooth star in infinite dimension. But the other stuff, I'm quite confident it at, le at least extends to Hilbert space. Okay, all right, thanks. I mean, it really depends on which results you're asking about. I mean, for example, the, 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 these continuity results uh, um, of, of the, of the uh, prox operator here. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm quite confident that this extends beyond this, the setting that I've presented here. The semi-smooth star business or semi-smoothness alone in infinite dimension is, is a lot more subtle, I would assume. Yeah. All right, thanks. Russell? Hi, Russell. Um, the question about um, non-convex functions, you have a problem that, that the prox mapping is, is defined as the arg min of something. And if you have a non-convex function, you don't necessarily have an arg min, but you still have an expression for the resolvent. So do you have to do all this analysis for just resolvents? Um, and not worrying about them necessarily delivering, you know, the, the operator delivering the arg min, but just some point in the in the in the resolvent. And so, do you see a way forward with that? Yeah. So that's that's a very good point, of course. So the 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 the, the way that we derived all these results, like let's say these slightly more uh, subtle variational analytic points, is really I, I rewrite the proximal operator using the optimality conditions. And then I'm throwing uh, variational analysis at the optimality conditions. And of course that doesn't work anymore because it's not characterized through the, uh, through the optimality conditions in the non-convex case. So I would have to go through resolving. I haven't even, I haven't thought about that. But that's that's of course a very good point. Well, I guess I mean I guess just the, the question is, is it important that it's an arg min? I mean, you can still evaluate a, a resolvent and you get a point, or maybe a whole set of points. And um, you know, it's I've only come across in, in algorithms where it's important that it's an arg min, but you know, for general analysis, I, I mean I don't see where the where that property of it being an arg min actually is really relevant. I, it's, it's hard for me to, to now say it's not important. It, I feel there, there were points in the analysis where I used the fact that, that it is a, is a minimizer, but I would, my gut feeling is that large parts of the analysis do not need it. But I, I, I haven't thought, of, thought it through thoroughly enough to, to give an educated answer. But I think just uh, you pointing out going through resolvents here, I mean, that's, that's, that's very good because the, the, like the semi-smooth star business, as I pointed out, it was already like foreshadowed in this one uh, line where I talked about this if and only if the semi-smoothness star is 
preserved undertaking inverses. So that's, that, that's certainly a nice thing if you're working with resolvent maps. And that's then of course, it will boil down to, well, the semi-smoothness of the sub-differential operator itself again. And then there, I don't know that the convexity is, how much the convexity plays a role there anymore. Uh, that, and that's definitely something I, 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 want, I want to look at. And uh, I think in Boris's papers there, there, well, he's more going into the twice epideferentiability and without convexity, you might not have an equivalence there, but there's certainly, there certainly things to be, to be said there. Yeah, thanks for the question and for pointing the resolvent uh, thing out. Thank you. Thank you, Rasa. Are there other questions? So, Tim, I like very much uh, the, the formula for the projection on the epigraph. I mean, this, so for instance, so, th so this formula can be of some use when one is, when one, one wants to, to minimize the composition of two functions. I mean, the, the objective function is a composition. Yeah, by rewriting, but this is very, yeah, let's say, uh, yeah, uh, easy trick by writing the problem as a constraint problem yeah, with respect to an element in the epigraph. And one can apply, I don't know, so some algorithms in order to, to solve that problem. And one, one needs a formula yeah, for the projection on the epigraph. But then, okay, but then I have a question now. So what I know is, that, so there is a, a paper actually, which you also mentioned, this is Kerkia, Pesquet and so on, okay, where they have a formula for the projection when the function has open domain. Yes. And the, the, the formula is much easier. Yes, uh, that, is, that is correct. We, we also, um, you're right, uh, that, that paper, is it in the, no. Uh, okay. In the paper, it's, it's a paper by Pesquet et al. Yes. You're right. Uh, there, uh, there is a different formula for the projection onto the epigraph when the function has open, Domain, I yeah. I agree. Um, this, um, but what is the exact question? <laughs> Sorry. The question is okay. I mean, I just want to point out this is in that case there is no need to yeah to to solve an uh, equation or like to yeah like to to find lambda yeah since yeah I mean the, from this point of view it's kind of, it's, it's an easier setting let's say yeah yes. I just want to point out this yeah so. No, no, of, of course you're right, and uh, I think there is a there's we definitely discussed this in the paper, um, but uh, I I don't remember the de the full details. But uh, yeah, just for the for the for the for the rest, I guess of the audience who are not aware of that, there is a paper by Pesquet and and co-authors where they talk where they use make use of epigraphical projections in a bigger uh, bigger context, but uh, their only restriction is that the, the underlying function has to have open open domain, um, and that that certainly complements uh, our our approach and maybe is, is is simpler than our approach for sure in in this in this scenario. Um, but also, I I mean I my 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 hook for this whole thing was epigraphical projections, but it's really. I mean, I, I started, it's really more about variational properties of the proximal operator as a function of lambda. I mean, I, the, it, the, the epigraphical projections and the level set projections are more broadly po, epi, uh, prox operators for uh, post compositions. That's a selling point, but like the, the interest for me was really more the the variational analysis of the prox operator as a function of x and lambda simultaneously, and not and, and it's more. It's not just the prox operator, right? Because the, the 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 kernel function omega doesn't have to be a Euclidean norm squared. I mean, it could be any strongly convex, actually any strictly convex and level bounded function. It, that is that is C two. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there further questions? So, and just for understanding, Tim. So, last yeah, last question from my side. So, okay. if I have a function which is proper convex lower semi-continuous, and I would like to 
yeah, to to find to detect its minimizer, then then uh, yeah, I can do uh, I can use the proximal point algorithm and uh, yeah, don't have to yes to 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 look at the function from another perspective. But what you're saying is that okay, you have the sub differential and check yeah if it is semi smooth star or not. Okay? Yeah. So yeah. why to do this? So, so this is this means uh, yeah a lot of work. I mean it's not not so trivial to to check this property. But provide I can check. Yeah, and I can verify that I'm able to do this. Yeah, that the differential is semi smooth star. What is the benefit? Of well, I mean, the, the, this is not an al this is not an algorithmic framework to, to uh, if you give me a given function to find a minimizer of f. Okay. I think um, it it is more how how can I compute certain projections? How can I certain compute? projections onto the epigraph how can I compute projections onto the level set it's more if if these occur as constraints say mm -hmm. not not f necessarily as an objective function however if f is the objective function what 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 your trick will always afford you is you transform a a, a problem with maybe just a lower semi continuous objective into well you just move it to the you move f to the constraints mm -hmm. and then xt is in the epigraph and you minimize over t of course that but i i, I i'm not saying that will beat on a given function okay. <laughs> approximately like, like the 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 the, the proximal right. that's mm -hmm. that's not at all what i'm trying to okay consider. okay um it, it, it's it's really i mean what what i'm trying to basically say is well we we don't we didn't know too much about the proximal operator as a function of the prox parameter and knowing something about it may be useful in various contexts like epigraphical projections level set projections or even computing proximal operators of compositions yes Okay. Yeah. This is a great takeaway. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Look close at the uh, at the projection on, on epigraph of function, and uh, yeah, there are not many works on this topic, but uh, yeah, this is a, a great uh, motivation. Yeah. And, and to really, I mean, as from the point of view of numerical implementation, there, there is not much on 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 this topic, and it, it can be of some use, as we said before, in particular when when one is looking at the minimization of compositions but the, the, there are yeah much more examples yeah. yeah and and as i said well we we didn't even like uh put a lot of thought in well the the, the numerical part because we we just straight up took the the sc1 optimization framework plugged our functions in okay then observe that in our simple scenario you don't need the backtracking most of the time and then it becomes a fairly simple algorithm which works admirably even in comparison to procedures that are tailored to like one particular instance like say l1 uh projections and and, and the like mm -hmm. okay thank you tim so this is the paper look this is a slide with the paper this is a uh, Kerkia, uh, it's probably, yeah. You know, you, you see it on, on the last line? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Ch yeah. Ch yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. So, uh, are there other comments? Patrick? Yeah. Tim. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I had a question. You mentioned um, extending to operators, uh, maximum limit operators at the end. And actually, there's some somewhat of an open question in this area, and I was wondering if you had thought about this. What is the proper definition of the perspective for set value operator? In other words, by proper, I mean that if you stake a subdifferential, you would get back the subdifferential of the perspective. And now this definition involves the value of the function, so it's kind of hard to to extend, but I was wondering if you had any thoughts on this because it's a, it's a missing piece of the puzzle. Yes, um, I well, you're putting the finger in the wound a little bit because I have I have thought about well, actually, what I what I did think about is extending the notion of the perspective 
when the perspective parameter like lambda is a is a matrix and i i kind of hit the wall now but now you're saying i should look at into extending the notion of a perspective map for set valued functions right yeah i mean it's because it's you know many things we do like in convolution right well we know when we we, we take this one to operators the, the the proper extension would be the, the parallel sum why because you know the the the, the substantial of the convolution and the you know qualification is actually the parallel sum of the of the uh, subdifferentials. So likewise here, what is the right notion of perspective on operators that makes the subdifferential of the perspective being the perspective in the operator sense of the, the subdifferential? And it's, I don't know, I, th that would lead to another type of analysis, right? But it, it seems that the, the right definition is, uh, is elusive somehow. So it's, uh, I think it's a nice open, question that they could also have impact on your work, but more generally in that field, right? We like to extend things from uh, convex analysis to multiple operators. And this extension here is missing somehow. Um, um, so I don't know if anybody else had looked at, at that or it's... Uh, I mean, I, I have no, I have no, uh, I, I cannot say that I have any, any, anything to contribute to that, but I, I, I definitely wrote, <laughs> wrote it down for myself. Uh, to, to think to think about it. Um, All right. Thanks Thank a you. lot for, for, for the comment. Thank you, Patrick. Other questions? So let us stop here. So thank you, Tim, for a very nice talk, for a very cool discussion. Many questions, many good answers. So uh, yeah, as uh, always, we'll post a video and the slides on our website. And I'd like to announce uh, our next speaker. So uh, this will be Wala Mursi uh, next Monday, same time. Have a great week. See you next Monday. Yeah.